Labor Day weekend, the last gasp of summer, right? Bittersweet. You're not quite sure you really want life to go on from this point, but here we are. We take one last holiday when we can get it. And I don't know what kind of a summer you've had. Um, it's possible you've had a summer where you feel well rested right now. There are a large group of people here that have been helping get the new auditorium ready who probably feel just a little bit exhausted, burnt out a little bit, maybe. And uh, that, that's a possibility. I don't know what you've come from. Physical exhaustion is one thing, but think of all the other ways that we get exhausted and burnt out. Maybe you've felt them. I think the great, a good example of this is with raising children, just as parents. There's a lot of physical labor to making sure children don't die, isn't there? Right? There's a lot of labor that goes into that, making sure they eat healthy, could you imagine if you left them on their own, right? They're up any hour of the night. You got to feed them. And from the time they're little, you just got to keep this thing going, keep this thing alive, you know, keep going. It's a lot of work, but there are other aspects to parenting, aren't there? There are other levels of anxiety and labor that go into it that can leave us feeling exhausted, maybe discouraged. Prayer, just the, just the amount of emotional stress that goes into it. Anybody here have teenagers? <laughs> you can add your amen, right? The emotional stress, the, whatever it is, trying to figure out what they're thinking all the time, there's a lot to it. Quite possibly there are people in the room today who have gone through a summer, maybe it's not so much physical labor, but maybe it's been a summer of trials, of suffering, of medical exams, of a broken marriage that maybe you're trying to save, of children that have walked out the door that you wish would have followed the Lord, but they're not. There's all kinds of ways in which we can feel burnt out, apathetic. I just don't care anymore. I've been praying so long for this, and it's just not happening. There is good news for us this morning, because there are a lot of people in the Bible, a lot of people in the Bible, who have felt the same kinds of anxiety, burnout, discouragement. Think of uh, how many people in Scripture have just walked away or wanted it all to end. Elijah, Lord, please, I've tried everything. Please take me now. There's nothing left to do, and so on. If that's you then we are in the right place this morning. We are going to be in Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to look at the story of Moses, title of this sermon, From Burnout to Burning Bush, Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to look at a man, just travel through the story of how Moses went from being burnt out to being a peculiar light for God. Exodus 3, let's read together, and before we read, we'll just pray. Father, we are coming to your word again, just coming into your text. And Lord, I ask that you would prepare our hearts for this moment. There are people here in this room who no, no doubt have broken hearts, heavy hearts, anxious hearts, hearts that are discouraged. And Lord, speak truth into us and into our lives, into our souls, and do this for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus 3. We're going to read the whole chapter. And then we're going to try and make sense of it. Verse 1, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. 
Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, But I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I, if I come to the people of Israel and they say, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, God said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord. Now, uh, just a side note for a moment, Lord, capital letters, when you see that word in your English Bible, it's the Hebrew word for Yahweh. Well, what does Yahweh mean? It's really the third person, third person reference of what God has just revealed about himself, the I am. God can say I am because he's speaking about himself, but when we talk about God, we use a different form, obviously, because we're speaking about someone else. We say, He is. That's what Yahweh means. So that's what God is saying here to him. The Lord, Yahweh, say this to the people, verse 15, Yahweh, the He is, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and uh, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to them, the Lord Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, what we need to realize is many times over, God is responding and saying, I this, I that, at this point. We've seen it already. I will bring you up out of affliction. I promise in verse 17 and so on. Verse 19, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold, jewelry, and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. You, so shall you plunder the Egyptians. All right, we, we need to really focus in on one specific aspect of this text, and that is what Moses is experiencing in this moment. The way we're going to do that and to try and kind of flesh out, try and develop the fact that Moses is coming at this from that burnt out state of mind, we're going to look at it from three different directions, okay? We're standing in Exodus 3, we're watching the scene play out, and the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, where is he coming from? Where's Moses coming from? Right? What's his backstory? Backstory is very important in context. So what's the backstory of this? Secondly, we're going to look at where is he now? And thirdly, we're going to take a look at where is he going? We're just going to take a little peek into the future. We're not going to read it today, but we're going to take a little peek and see just where Moses is going from this moment. 
And the reality is there is good news for burnouts. There is. God has something good to tell us today. So let's look. First of all, where is Moses coming from? Well, very simply put, he's coming from a desert of disappointments. I think it's highly symbolic that he's out in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, because that's not where Moses started. Anyone familiar with Exodus 1 and Exodus 2 knows that this is uh, the, the opposite of a rags to riches story, right? Rags to riches, you've heard the stories of people that start with nothing and, and no one in their life to support them and so on. And eventually they become like the CEO of something or a Hollywood star or a musician or whatever. And we trace the backstory and we say, wow, how did you get here? How did you make this happen? And sometimes we even make movies out of it, right? Because the story is so good. But then you have other stories that would be... Well, we don't actually title them, but I guess if we were, we would call them riches, or riches to rags stories. We don't necessarily make movies out of those too often. It's not something we aspire to, right? There's a whole string of people that have won the lottery over and over, become multimillionaires, and one story after another after another of people who have just blown the money and blown their lives, end up in tragedy with absolutely nothing to them. Riches to rags. That's really Moses' biography to this point. It start, started really well. Kind of got a kickstart on life. He was supposed to be killed right when he was born. And long story short, he isn't killed. At this point, we can figure that out. Instead, he is miraculously rescued and not only is he rescued out of everyone's control, but he is brought right into the palace of the very man who wanted to kill him for political reasons. He ends up growing up in Pharaoh's palace as one of Pharaoh's daughter's adopted sons. He gets the best education of the land. He learns how to speak well, he learns all the skills of fighting. He would have learned all the, the history of the great nation of Egypt at that time. He would have had all the education. He would have had the best health care, all the comforts, all the pleasures. He would have had all of these things at his fingertips, riches, right? He's got it all. He's got a head start on life. And more than that, you can kind of see that it seems like there's a higher power that has control of the whole situation. It seems like someone is sparing his life for some reason, and we could maybe even come up next to Moses and say, well, Moses, at this point, it really looks like God has set you up for success. In fact, it looks like maybe God has a wonderful plan for your life. You ever heard that? Some people think that's what the Christian message is, but it's not. We'll see that as we move forward. Kind of reminds me of the little idealistic lion cub Simba who is looking at the future. He's got everything at his fingertips. He's the son of the king. He is going to have control of the world. And he's got every, the future is bright and he just can't wait to be king, right? Aren't you glad I didn't sing that? And then everything comes crashing in. Now to help us with how everything comes crashing in with Moses, I'm going to use the words of another preacher. His name was Stephen, and he was preaching a sermon about 1,500 years after this experience in Exodus 3. 1,500 years after the life of Moses, really. And he's going to give some play-by-play -play commentary that's really going to help us with what happens next. Now listen to this. This is Stephen preaching, and he says... Now Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Okay, we know that. And he was mighty in his words and in his deeds. Good. When he was 40 years old, Stephen says, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and he avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. Why did he do that? What did he hope to accomplish? I was raised kind of hearing, you know, Sunday school lessons 
that put this in, in terms of, well, you know, Moses didn't realize that God was watching every move, right? Have you heard this before? He looked this way and he looked that way, but he got found out. He killed someone and he got found out. Well, listen, the reality is from what Stephen tells us next is that Moses wanted to be found out. He wanted somebody to see this and he wanted that someone to go somewhere with the message. Listen to what Stephen says. He says, he struck down the Egyptian because he supposed, he assumed that his brothers would understand something. That they would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand. Do you, under, do you, do you see Moses' outlook on life right now? He kills the Egyptian taskmaster, hoping that the slave whom he had saved and rescued was going to go home to all of his buddies and say, hey, I got great news for you. Moses is here. He's going to save us all. God has a wonderful plan for Moses' life. We didn't know it before, but we know it now. And he thought they were going to go and Spread the good news of Moses, the gospel of Moses, that God was going to bring salvation by Moses. But, Stephen says in Acts 7, they did not understand. It didn't go as planned. In fact, on the following day, Stephen tells us, Moses appeared to them as they were quarreling. Two guys are fighting and he tried to reconcile them. Now what? What possible place did he think he had to do this? It was his assumption. God has a wonderful plan for my life, and I'm in the middle of it. I'm here to fix the problem. He sees them quarreling. He tries to break it up and says, Men, you're brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor pushed him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Well, I wasn't expecting that. I was kind of expecting a, oh, you're right, Moses, you're a good guy. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do what you say because you're going to fix our problems. But instead, listen to this. At this response, Stephen tells us, Moses fled and he became an exile. And to make matters worse, to make matters worse, not only is he disappointed, plans have failed, nothing is going as planned, but it takes 40 years to get to this spot in Exodus 3. That's a long time. I actually just passed that landmark this past week. That's a long time. I don't feel young. It's a long time. And he's 40 years just wallowing in his failure keeping sheep in the middle of nowhere, in a desert, by himself. They're not even his sheep. Hey, how's it working out for you, Moses? God has a wonderful plan for your... Yeah, that one kind of fizzled. And at this point, the fire in Moses' heart is out. He's empty of hope, ambition, motivation. Maybe, uh, maybe for you, it's being a parent. I love watching new parents because I, I have four kids of my own now, and I remember what it was like with the first one. Very idealistic. Every you got to have the best technology and the best. You know, this is the way to do it. And you get lots of advice too. I, you know what? If <laughs> You're not going to get much advice from me. After having four, all I've realized is I have no idea what I'm doing. That's about, that's about all I've realized, right? And at some point as time passes and life happens and these kids grow up, they have to go to school somewhere and they have to stand on their own two feet someday. And as, as things go, come and struggles come and you listen to their struggles and you listen to their temptations and you, you're trying to steer them down the right path, but they want to go this way and you want them to go, they go this way and, and, and it just doesn't work out. And eventually you can get discouraged. 
Maybe they don't thank you enough for what you've done and all the hard work you've put in. Don't thank you for the prayers. You keep praying and praying. And maybe, maybe you're wondering, is God listening? Is God hearing my prayers? Maybe it's a marriage. And, and, and when you were married, I, again, all the idealism of, I've married my perfect soulmate. This person is going to fulfill me. This person is going to give me what I need. I'm, we're going to live that fairy tale ending. And now, 10 years, maybe not even that long, and it's not working out as planned, and we find out that marriage is actually hard work. Maybe you had plans of going off into the sunset to be a missionary. And uh, you were going to go to Bible school and you had all these plans made out of how God was going to work out that wonderful plan for your life. And it didn't quite work out the way you thought it would. And now you're sitting here. Burnt out. What's next? Maybe a bit cynical about God's wonderful plan. Well, listen, let's look at where Moses is now. He is Involved, he is encountering God. He is in a vertical encounter on holy ground. And notice, God tells him in verse 5, Do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. What does holy mean? It's a word that is often used very lightly in our society, but it means to be separate, to be unlike anything else. Right? There are no cows that are unlike anything else, right? There's no smoke that is unlike anything else other than when God's presence is there. But God is unlike anything else, and he's the only thing that is unlike anything else. You can't put him in a category. You can't somehow go to the library and put God in his section with all the other subjects. He is not like anything else. He's above everything. He cannot be categorized. He's holy. And the fact that he tells Moses, take your shoes off, you're standing on holy ground, is not because the particular geographic spot was special, but because God was there. He's on holy ground because the holy God is meeting with him. Now notice that as he meets him, Moses, first of all, in verse 6, is afraid to look at God. That's his first reaction in being in the presence of a holy God is fear. Usually as we get to know God and his mercy and his grace and understand more of his presence and build a deeper relationship with him, that, that terrifying fear turns into just awe of all that he is in his holiness over time. But in verse 14, God says to Moses, after Moses asked, well, what will I call you? And when the people ask me, who are you? God reveals himself in a certain way. And whenever God reveals himself in a certain way, he expects us to respond to that revelation. And he reveals himself to Moses and to the people and says, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. Now, what on earth does this mean? It has to do with his holiness because he's like no one else. First of all, it has to do with the fact that he has no rivals. There are no other gods. It's not here is the Israelite God and here are the Egyptian gods and we're going to have a contest to see who will win this fight. Those gods don't exist. They exist in people's heads. They were used to manipulate people and to try and win wars and to build societies and structures and morality in different nations. That's what they were used for in the ancient Near East. But God is God. He's real, living, he's personable, He is powerful. He has no rivals. The one living God. There's no other creator. He is the creator God. Secondly, he needs nothing. He needs nothing. He is the I am. The the sense of this language is I am being who I am being. That's always been the case. It's ever present. It's present tense. I am. Not I was. Not I will be. But I am. In this moment I am, in this moment I am, and on and on. He's outside of time. He needs nothing in order to survive. Nothing. 
Nobody holds God's breath in their hands. No one holds his heartbeat. No one determines when God lives or dies. God cannot die. He is the source of life. He has no beginning and he has no end. He needs nothing in order to survive and he needs nothing in order to accomplish his great plans. He's self-existent, self-sufficient, and self-sustaining. It's very interesting because Moses was completely focused on himself. God says, I'm going to send you. Moses says, who am I? Who am I? Don't we live in a society that's constantly trying to figure out who I am? Build an identity? There's all kinds of identity crisis in our society with all of the individualism, right? That what are we trying to do? We're, we're, we're going on our trips and, and we're going to make a, a face on social media and so on. We're, we're going to try and build our identity. We get very angry when others might not see our identity the way we do and so on. And Moses is completely focused on himself, but Moses has the wrong impression right from the start. He may be thinking... Now think about this. This is what he was thinking before. God has a wonderful plan. God has a plan that I'm going to, I'm going to be the one that's going to bring salvation to the people. Maybe he's thinking that God is recruiting Moses because God needs him. But it's just not true. God is not calling Moses because he needs Moses. He's actually calling Moses by his grace because Moses needs God. God wants to reveal himself. He wants to reveal his glory to Moses in a way that only the story of the Exodus and the redemption that's going to happen and Mount Sinai and 40 years in the desert can do. You know, the children of Israel, a long history of them going back to this idea that we can do it on our own, that God needs us. And quite often that's how they thought of their sacrifices, their altars. They would put animals on the altars thinking that God needs them. God needs us to provide these and it satisfies him for a while. It makes him happy. So put another animal on the altar because that makes God happy and so on. That's what they were. They were constantly going back to that. But listen to what God says in Psalm 50. He says, not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. No, you're, you're constantly putting them there. But I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your fields, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't don't need your cattle. I don't need you to be offering these cybers. They're not feeding me. He's not some schoolboy that we have to provide a lunch to every day. God's basically saying, I own it all. I own the lunch and I I own the lunch box. I own the whole thing. Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all, the mo- all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? That's a good question. What does God eat? Doesn't need to eat. Doesn't need to be sustained. He is self-sustaining. Offer to God Listen to that. And so God changes the perspective. It's not that I need you. It's not that I need you. Listen, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Your sacrifices are there to thank me for everything I've given you. It's me giving you the gifts and you just responding in thanksgiving and in praise. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. And you shall glorify me. See, that's how it works. The I am existed before all else was created. We cannot take away from him and we certainly don't add to him. He doesn't need us to agree with him. He doesn't need us to accomplish his work. He doesn't need us to worship him. But rather, we need him. And when we worship him and work for him and walk with him, we get to experience blessing from him. We are ultimately blessed. And on the the other side, when we refuse to worship him, we don't take away from him. We certainly 
Don't rob him. Don't diminish his glory or who he is, but rather we ourselves run into a brick wall. We destroy ourselves in the process, but God will ultimately be glorified because of who he is. He's the I am. Not only that, but he's unchanging. He cannot be outdated. He cannot be outdated. He doesn't need an update like your iPhone, right? He doesn't grow out. This is what our society is trying to tell us today. You know, if you believe in the Christian definition of marriage, that uh, you're, you're trying to take us back to the dark ages. If you believe in the Christian definition of sexuality, that you're just trying to, to bring us back to something we've long since left behind. I mean, we are far more sophisticated than that. And meanwhile, the new definition of sexuality is just destroying us. Destroying us. We keep running into a brick wall as a society because we will not bow to what God has said. He's not outdated. He hasn't changed what he thinks. He hasn't changed his character. He hasn't changed what he says. He's always the same. Always the same. Unchanging. Always. Notice what he said. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all. All generations, God hasn't changed. This is who he is. This is our great God. Yet, as high and as exalted as he is. Listen to these words in verse 7. The Lord said, I, am sure, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down. Right to where they were. As high and as exalted, he needs nothing at all. And yet, here he is coming down to his people. They're suffering, they're struggling. Not only that, right in this moment, he's coming down to Moses. He's coming right to where Moses is in his place of failure, in his place of hopelessness, in his place of emptiness. He's coming right to where Moses is because this is the God that we worship. This is the God who has revealed himself through scripture. Now notice, it gets even more amazing because if we fast forward 1,500 years, we're going to listen to the words of Jesus Christ himself speaking to people who rejected him, who didn't want to listen to him. And he said to them, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. They looked at him and they said, uh, you're not even 50 yet. And you're trying to tell us that you know Abraham personally, like you've met him. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you that before Abraham even existed, I am. So you mean to tell me that this self-existent one who is all glorious, eternal, unchanging, who does not need us to fulfill his tasks and his missions, he literally took on flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ because you and I desperately needed him to save us from our rebellion, from our guilt, from our sin. And he came right to where we are as close as suffering under our own pain, our own judgment, all of our wrongs, all of the sins that we had committed, he suffered not just in them, but he suffered for them. And so John Stott says, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? That lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. 
There's no greater reason to trust this self-sufficient God with your life, with my life, than watching him take on human flesh and die our death and then rise again from the dead. There's no greater reason to just lay our hands into his life. In fact, we could go further and say this this morning. I think as we stand in God's presence, it becomes very clear that this idea that God has a wonderful plan for my life is a silly, silly statement. You know what the truth is? God has a wonderful plan for his own glory. And by his grace... He calls us into that plan. He calls us to go on mission with him by his grace. And what strength do we use to raise our kids, to love our wives or our husbands? What power do we have? What strength do we have to not burn out, to not burn out, and in our discouragement to continually go? What is it? It's God himself. He gives us everything we have. We just keep going deeper and deeper into his debt. The more we serve him, it puts everything upside down. And Moses is starting to realize, and as we continue down Exodus 3, we start seeing that Moses starts with, who am I? He's so self-focused. But by the end, we, all we're hearing is God saying, I will, I will, I will, I promise, I know. He's going down. Now it's completely God and not Moses. Well, where he's come from, desert of despair, desert of disappointment, where he is now, vertical encounter on holy ground, where is Moses going? He's going to be a peculiar light to the world. In other words, a burning bush. I love the way it's emphasized in verse 3. Moses said, I would imagine if you're in the desert long enough, you will start talking to yourself. He says to himself, I will turn aside to see this great sight. What's the great sight? It's a bush, Moses. No big deal. Just a bush in the desert. There's nothing special about that. We're not going to start handing out pamphlets and getting people to come and see this. Are you going to name it? Oh, no. Moses tells us, I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. It's on fire, but it's not consumed. There's something different about this bush. Something powerful, but it's not in the bush. It's in the fire. It's as though God is saying to Moses, Moses, you are just like this helpless bush in a desert, and I'm going to light you up. A lot of examples of this in Scripture. This guy by the name of Jeremiah, who was a prophet, and he would preach the word and he would get criticized for it. He'd preach the word, people would tell him to be quiet. He'd preach the word and, uh, and, and he would get punished for it, get thrown in prison. Finally, he's like, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And he tries, he tries to hold it in. I'm not going to be God's messenger. It's too painful. There's no reward in this. He's burnt out. And he says, he says in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in, and I can't. I just can't. It's harder to hold it in than it is to let it out and take the consequences. It's a burning bush. We look at Jeremiah and we say, there's nothing real special about this guy. There's something going on in his heart. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight. It was true. Of course, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, but in human form while he was here, he moved in weakness. The prophet says about him that he was like a root out of a dry ground. There's no form. There's no majesty that we should ever take a second look. But people did take a second look. There was something in him that was different than anything else around him. He was unique. Of course, being the son of God, he lived it out perfectly, sinless in every way, but he lived out being moved by the power of the Holy Spirit everywhere he went. 
And people look, people notice, people watch. The early church was born this way. Just a bunch of people sitting in Jerusalem, not really quite sure what's going on here. And one day the Holy Spirit comes down, the day of Pentecost, and tongues of fire are on them. I'm not exactly sure what that looked like. And there was a mighty sound of a mighty rushing wind, and they all started speaking in different languages. And there were lots of visitors in Jerusalem at the time because it was a festive holiday. And, uh, and they're all listening, going, hey, wait a second. These guys are speaking my language. They're locals. How did they learn my language? We need to turn aside and see this great sight. Peter gets up and he starts preaching about Jesus and telling people they need to repent and turn to Christ. The Apostle Paul is another one. He quite often didn't really know exactly where he was going next. There's one case where he's traveling and he tries to go one way and he can't, and he tries to go another way and he can't, and not quite sure where he's going, and he, well, I'm just going to go straight ahead, I guess, and end up, where are we going? Where are we going? Inside? Oh, Philippi. Well, let's go to Philippi then. And they get to Philippi, and eventually he gets arrested. He gets thrown in prison, and he's singing praises in the middle of the night. I mean, th this is a great strategy for building a church, don't you think? Not quite. And the, the jailer ends up getting saved and a bunch of people, a church is formed there. He goes to Corinth, a place that was filled with all kinds of Greek gods and all kinds of immorality. He's in fear and trembling, he tells them later on when he went. And at one point, he just, he's going to give up. He's going to leave. He's been preaching and preaching and preaching. Nothing's happening. And God shows up in a dream and says, Paul, stay, stay. I have much people in this place. I've selected many people. Don't give up. Stay. And he stays. Paul eventually says of himself, he said, but we, this is our testimony, we have this treasure, the gospel, the power of God, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. Not to us. We feel burnt out. God's power lives on. We are afflicted in every way, Paul says, but not crushed, perplexed, but not given to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our mortal flesh. He's basically saying, the death of Jesus is very clear in our frail human frame. It's there so that people can look and see the life of Jesus. What keeps these guys going? What's the power behind them? It's a peculiar sight. It's a peculiar burning light. Eugene Peterson said, describing this type of person, he says, we speak our words of praise in a world that is hellish. We sing our songs of victory in a world where things get messy. We just keep worshiping. We keep singing. We live our joy among people who neither understand nor encourage us. But the content of our lives is God, not humanity. We're not scavenging in the dark alleys of the world, poking in its garbage cans for a bare subsistence. We're traveling in the light towards God who is rich in mercy and strong to save. It's Christ, not culture, that defines our lives. It is the help we experience, not the hazards we risk that shape our days. That's what it looks like to be a burning bush. It's not going to be easy, though. Immediately, Moses is going to face his fears and his doubts. In another chapter, he's going to face the past, the fact that he murdered someone in Egypt 40 years ago. God is going to confront him with his guilt. And by chapter 5, he's going to enter Pharaoh's palace and say, let my people go and so on. Pharaoh's going to laugh in his face, shut him out and, and tell the people, work harder. We're actually not going to help you now. You've got to get the same amount done in less time and so on. And the people are leaving. The leaders are leaving the courtroom and they see Aaron and his brother, or Moses and his brother Aaron standing there and uh, they point the finger again and say, this is all your fault. But this time it's different. Moses doesn't have this mentality anymore. It's all up to me. God needs me. I, I'm here to save the day. He doesn't. Immediately he goes to Yahweh, the I am, and says, why did you ever send me if this is the way it's going to work out? 
And over and over again, you see this cycle in Moses' life from this point on, where he's continually going back to the Lord, back to the Lord, back to the Lord, leaning hard on the Lord for everything in his life, everything that he needs. And in the end of his life, I wish it could be said at the end of my life, the end of your life, of people that trusted the Lord for strength, not ourselves, worked on the Lord's strength, not our own. At the end of his life in Deuteronomy 34, 7, it says Moses was 120 years old when he died. Pretty decent. His eye was undimmed and his strength was unabated. Just living on the Lord's strength every day of his life. It was a famous preacher, Henry Varley, who said those life-changing words to Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody, years ago. And he said, Dwight, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man or a woman who are fully surrendered to him. Fully surrendered. Not my plan. Not the plan for my life but the plan for God's glory, and we are on mission with God. 